Namaste. Namaste. That's it. Namaste. Aapka fir se swagat hai. Humare our stupid reactions he did. Namaste, Corbin. <laughs> Namaste, Corbin. Namaste, Corbin. Uh, Do you look in the mirror every morning and say that to yourself? Namaste, Corbin. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they wrote us on. Please follow us on Instagram. Juicy content. It's so juicy. And thank you for some Patreon followers on Twitter account. Today we're doing a little educational video. Oh. It's been requested for uh, a little while now and highly requested. Is this about how to properly wipe your butt? No, this is about what, what is Hinduism. Oh. Yeah, so I think it's a little educational video uh, introducing people that know nothing. Oh, we know stuff about Hinduism. Yeah. Uh, obviously. We're not complete buffoons. No. Uh, but I think, uh, hopefully, since it's been requested so much, I think they think it's a good video. I, I hope so. I hope Hindus are the ones recommending. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> but I think it would be nice to know, because uh, obviously we watch films that India, Hinduism is a huge part of that. Yes, yeah, slightly. Uh, and so I'm hoping it explains certain little nuances that we don't know yet. And thank you. Is this a result of us having asked stupid babies to send us more information mm -hmm. about Hinduism and mm -hmm. Islam? Just and... so just so we can uh, figure, like, know yeah. like, when we see stuff and it, it's talking about certain things in Hinduism or whatever uh, that we can know about. And so I'm hoping... And there's a lot... Of, I know this about Hinduism. There's a lot to learn. A lot to learn. <laughs> yeah, but here we go. Hinduism, the religion of over a billion people, is the world's oldest religion and probably the most confusing one to non-Hindus. Some say it isn't even a religion, more a way of life. Hindus themselves call it the Sanatana Dharma, the eternal tradition. So, what is Hinduism? Does YOLO apply to them? And does YOLO apply to them? And who is this elephant guy? Well, Ganesh. let's find out. I know that one. Yep. Hinduism is the world's organization and the nomads that came into India around 1500 BC. He's Some Irish. scholars say it could even go back many more thousands of years. But we won't delve too deep into dates because dates in Hinduism are very, very controversial. But one thing is certain, Hinduism is old. Like, at least 36 <laughs> Hinduism has been around for so long that it and the concept of India itself are inseparable. Hindustan. Hindu and India even come from the same word. Sanskrit was the ancient language of the Hindus, and the Sanskrit name for the Indus River is Sindhu. The ancient Persians who sat across the Indus tended to switch their S's to H's, so Sindhu became Hindu. So the people living across the river became Hindus. That's the Persians cool. told the Greeks, who dropped that third, not Greek-like H, stuck in a very Greek-like E to the end, and boom, India. Hinduism has a long, long history. But today we'll be focusing on just the core beliefs of Hindus because I don't have the willpower to animate three-hour-long video. <laughs> Hindus are a diverse group. I love the Some are strict, dedicating their lives to prayer, while others don't believe in any gods but still follow Hindu philosophy. To make things easier to understand, let's break Hinduism down into seven core beliefs. So, here's my rap about the seven Hindu beliefs. You promised you weren't gonna do the rap. Come on, you're better than this, man. Fine. Here's the regular version then. One. Belief in one universal soul. Hindus believe in a universal soul known as Brahman. Mm. A formless, genderless source of all reality. Brahman is the universe and the material that makes up the universe. Okay. It's a trippy concept, but think of Brahman as an ocean and everything else as drops propelling out of that ocean. Separate for a time, but still the same thing, if that makes sense. Two, belief in an immortal individual soul. In Hinduism, souls are known as Atman. Actions of the soul while in a body have effects on that soul's next life. When you die, your soul moves to another new body. This is called transmigration. The kind of body the soul inhabits next is determined by karma. Three, belief in karma. Karma is action, usually good or bad actions that affect that society. For Hindus, karmic actions in the past affect us today and our actions today affect our soul's future. Four, belief in moksha. The goal in Hindu life is to somehow get back to Brahman. If a Hindu can do this, 
they will be freed from the cycle of life and death. This is called moksha. You can achieve moksha by realizing your oneness with Brahman. Mm. How you realize this is up to you. For this reason, Hindus pray, lead me from the unreal to the real. Five, belief in the Vedas. The Vedas are Hindu sacred books of knowledge. There are four Vedas. Hindus believe that all four were divinely revealed to ancient Hindu sages. We'll take a closer look at the Vedas in a while. Six, belief in cyclical time. For Hindus, there are no beginnings or endings. Time is a series of cycles, each cycle containing four ages or yugas. There's the Krita, the Treta, the Dwarapala, and the Kali. Added together, the four yugas total about 4.32 million years. At the end of each cycle, declining human morality leads to the total destruction of reality. Hindus believe that we are in the fourth and final yug, Kali. Seven, games. belief in it's Dharma. Dharma is a games. difficult oh, really? word no. to translate to English. Proper behavior is the best that I could come up with. Dharma maintains balance in the universe. As long as everything in the universe, like animals, plants, and humans, follow their Dharma, then everything will be fine. If they break from the Dharma, though, things will be super not fine. Dharma Productions. Mm -hmm. Each being has its own Dharma. A lion's Dharma is to kill and eat antelope. A king's dharma is to rule well. A subscriber's dharma is to smash the <laughs> light button. And win the for cash and the humans, their specific dharma is yeah, usually funny. based on their age and their caste. An old funny. priest will have a very different dharma than a young merchant, for example. So those are the seven core beliefs of Hinduism. With okay. them, you can understand the Hindu mindset. Unlike Christianity or Islam, Hinduism is a non-profit organization. That there is, is no funny. Jesus or Muhammad a for Hindus. There is no Bible, Quran, or Torah. Instead, they have a bunch, and I mean a bunch, a of, of different guys. sacred Prophet. texts. Prophet. The four Vedas form the basis that, of the that, Hindu that faith. So let's take a look at them. One, the Rig Veda. The, the Rig Veda yeah. is a collection of songs that praise and discuss ideas like truth, reality, and the universe, along with discussions on war, weddings, and rituals. Two, the Yajur Veda. The Yajur Veda covers stuff such as sacrificial rites and rituals. Three, the Sama Veda. Sama literally means sweet song that destroys sorrow. It is mostly songs dedicated to praising gods. It's different than the rest of the Vedas because it's set to music. Four, the Atarva Veda. The Atarva Veda is my favorite one. Do you want to curse your enemies? Or charm that special someone? Maybe learn to invoke rain or discover herbal medicine along with tips on warfare, like how to make poison arrows? Well, this Veda has you covered, along with a bunch of other charms and curses. It even has a curse against cursors. Avoid us, O oh curse, as a burning fire avoids a lake. Strike him here that curses us as the lightning of heaven, the tree. A link to the Atharveda is in the description, just in case you need a spell to get a wife or another to banish pigeons from your presence. <laughs> it's, it's great. After the Vedas come the Upanishads, which are like a sequel that makes the original make much more sense. They were probably written down between 800 BC and 500 BC, during a time when some Hindus started to question the Vedas. Their ideas became the Upanishads. The Upanishads are books on philosophy like we would expect from Plato or Aristotle. They're all about questioning, doubt, debate, and finding the answers to life's difficult questions. A theme in the Upanishads is that people are not their minds, or bodies, or egos, but their Atman. Your soul is you. Everything else is unreal and temporary. After the holy texts like the Vedas and the Upanishads are other less divine, but still important texts. These include stuff like the Puranas, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Ramaya and the Mahabharata. The Puranas are like encyclopedias of Hindu beliefs. There are 18 well-known Puranas. The Puranas cover things from yoga, to army organization, to taxation, to the caste system, to hell, gods, and everything in between. Wow. The Bhagavad Gita, the Gita for short, is one of Hinduism's most important texts. The Gita takes place on a battlefield where Arjuna, a great warrior, refuses to fight. Lord Krishna steps in to urge Arjuna to fight, and their discussion covers things such as dharma and how to live your best life. Arjuna eventually fought after Lord Krishna taught him the truth about dharma. As a member of the warrior caste, Arjuna's dharma was to fight against evil. 
The lesson of the Gita is that everyone faces difficult choices, but they must act on them according to their dharma, no matter how unpleasant. Along with all these philosophical texts, Hinduism has two action-packed epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The Ramayana, the earlier of the two texts, tells the story of Prince Rama. In the epic, you find out about his 14 year long exile, the abduction of his wife Sita, his battle with the evil demon Ravana, and his awesome monkey psychic Hanuman. What is that, Bill? The second epic, the Mahabharata, is the longest poem in the world. Five times the length of the Bible and eight times the length of the Iliad and Odyssey combined. It rivals five any soap opera you've ever seen when it comes to drama. <laughs> Gasps murder, <laughs> betrayal, love, love murder, and giant battles. The Mahabharata has it all. The theme running through the Ramayana and the Mahabharata is that Dharma must be followed for society to function. In Hinduism, there are four goals a person should aim for to have a good life. The first of these is Dharma, followed by Artha, the pursuit of prosperity and good reputation, Kama, pleasure both in body and in mind, and Moksha, the release from the cycles of rebirth. The Hindus should Sutra? practice Artha oh, and Kama with Dharma in order to achieve Moksha. There are also six temptations Hindus should try and avoid. Kama, lust and materialism. This Kama is different from the good Kama mentioned above, I know. Next is Kruda, which is anger. Loha, which is greed. Moha, which is unrealistic attachment to things, people and power. Mala, which is pride. And Matsarya, which is jealousy. By following their dharma and avoiding these six temptations, a Hindu can break the cycle of rebirth and have their soul merge back into Brahman. Gotcha. But even though everything comes from Brahman, who is the one real thing in Hinduism, Hindus do, after all, have thousands of gods. So let's take a look at them. First, there's Brahman, the creator. He created everything in the universe, but he is not <laughs> the universe You're itself, <laughs> because that's Brahman. They aren't the same thing. That last letter changes a lot, apparently. He has four heads. The heads face each of the four directions to represent the four Vedas, which he created, and the four Yugas. He also holds a book, which represents knowledge. Oh, and he rides a giant swan because he's just fancy. His consort is Saraswati, the goddess of learning. Vishnu, the preserver, is the second member of the Hindu trinity. He preserves the world created by Brahma until it is eventually destroyed by Shiva. He holds a discus, which he used to cut down anyone that tries to mess with his dharma, along with a conch, which symbolizes victory and the five elements. Vishnu has many, many avatars, such as Krishna or Rama, who he uses to defend dharma on earth. We know some of these. Oh, yep. and he rides a giant eagle named Garuda. Whoa. Vishnu has two consorts, the goddess Lakshmi and Budevi. Budevi is the earth goddess and Lakshmi is the goddess of good fortune and wealth. Next is Shiva the Destroyer, we know the Shiva. third member of the Hindu trinity. It's his job to destroy the universe in order to prepare for its renewal at the end of each cycle of time. The most identifiable of his features is his third eye, which he almost always keeps closed. If he does open it and you're in front of him, then you will have your face melted off. When not on making existence, Shiva enjoys long walks with his bull named Nandi. At the end of the Kali Yuga, the fourth age of the world, Shiva will perform a dance that destroys the universe. Which is odd because people have told me that my dance moves make them wish the world would end. So me and Shiva have quite a lot in common. Parvati and Sati are Shiva's consorts. <laughs> Shiva also has two sons, Ganesha that. and Murugan. Ganesha is the worship as the removal of obstacles and Murugan is the god Ganesha, of war. Ganesha holds a very special place in the we heart of Hindus, due to him being the remover of obstacles. The elephant head is the most obvious clue to identifying him. He was actually born with a human head, but after Shiva cut that one off, he kind of had to make do with an elephant one. Oh, really? If you're Christian or Muslim, you're aware that your religion has a bunch of different denominations, like Catholics or Protestants, Sunni and Shia, Hinduism has these too. Hindus developed four major denominations, some of which have their own subdivisions. The Vaishnavas primarily worship Vishnu and Shaivas primarily worship Shiva and his sons. Smartas follow sacred texts like the Puranas, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata rather than the Vedas. 
They worship five gods and goddesses, Ganesha, Durga, Surya, Shiva, and a preferred avatar of Vishnu. Finally, Shaktas worship the goddess Devi. Shaktas see Devi as the ultimate and eternal reality, like a feminine Brahman. Even though there are all these variations and more, the core beliefs of Hindus remain mostly the same. Hindus believe that Dharma keeps the balance in the universe. If the scales between good and evil start tipping towards evil, then something needs to intervene to fix the universe's Dharma. This divine intervention is known as an avatar. The literal meaning of the word avatar is descent. Avatars are gods that descend to earth to intervene whenever help is needed to restore Dharma. For example, when the earth was dragged underneath the ocean, Vishnu descended to earth as the avatar Raha, a boar, and dragged the earth back out. In other cases, Vishnu was born on earth as a human avatar like Rama or Krishna, where he spent his avatar's life fixing Dharma. So, the caste system. If you only know one thing about Hinduism, this is probably it. People see it as an oppressive system that locks people in place based on their birth. And for a huge part of history, that's what it's been, unfortunately. Let's do a quick explanation of what the caste system is. In Hinduism, there are four castes or classes that you can be born into. There's the Brahmin, the priest, the Kshatriyas, the warriors, the Vishas, the traders, and the Shudras, the manual laborers. The main basis for the caste system can be found in the Bhagavad Gita and the Rig Veda. Krishna says in the Gita, I have created a fourfold system in order to distinguish among one's qualities and functions. The Rig Veda also refers to the four castes. It says humans were created from parts of the god Purusha, the Brahman from his face, the Kshatriya from his arms, the Vaisha his thighs, and the Shudra his feet. This system was supposed to assign people functions based on their abilities, not their birth. If someone had the qualities of a Brahman or a Vaisha, they could fill those roles. The Gita didn't restrict movement among castes, and the caste system functioned as intended for a while, until a document known as the Laws of Manu came about around the 5th century BC, popularly referred to as the Manu Shmerti. They created hard rules for Hindu life. Hard. Two rules presented in it contributed to the way the caste system turned out. Manu states that the Brahman were the lords of all castes, and he forbid moving among the castes. The caste you were born into was now the caste you're stuck in. If you give humans a hierarchy, they'd exploit it, and things will go sour pretty quickly. As time passed, Hindus began thinking in terms of upper and lower castes. Soon, cleaning toilets, tanning leather, and dealing with meat products were thought to be impure. The people doing those jobs became untouchables. Right. The lowest of the low, a people without caste. And the rest is history. The modern world has brought many changes though. Now Hindus mix freely while working together in the same businesses, attending the same schools, and generally just living together. But when it comes to marriage, many Hindus still stick to their own caste. But this too is changing, and on Hindu dating websites, you can actually see people list a non-preference for caste. It'll say, caste no bar. Uh -huh. So, those are the basics of Hinduism. Think about that. It isn't even close to covering everything. One video simply can't do it. <clears throat> Hinduism is too diverse, too deep, and means too many different things to different people. But Learning even the basics of this fascinating and ancient religion gives us an insight into the worldview of over a billion people. And I hope you enjoyed it. You can find all the sources used in the description below. If you that was actually a really good video. I thought that was a really good video. One, one really impressive because he animates all of this. Wow. Which is not, not easy. <laughs> like that takes a lot of time mm -hmm. to animate, but he also gave it a lot of humor. And I feel I, I you, we're not going to break down what was, oh yeah. If, if we know something was true and what wasn't, that's for You're me. only hearing us nod about stuff we've heard before. Yeah. So we don't I'm, know whether it's accurate or not. I would assume a lot of this is accurate because I was sent this by a lot right. of people. Right. Um, and so I'm hoping a lot of the information was correct. You can let us know if it was. Obviously, we're not. And I, I, I actually did not know that caste came from Hinduism. Oh, yeah. No, I thought it was just an in, in Indian institution. It makes sense that it, it came from sure. a religion. Yeah. No, I knew, I knew untouchables were the lowest caste. And you know where I learned that, actually? 
I learned that from Lagan. I, I learned it when I was a kid. I saw Gandhi. Uh, and that was the first time I saw the representation of ben The Kingsley's? Untouchables. Yeah, Ben Kingsley's. I still And Richard Attenborough directed it. And, and I know a lot of you don't like that film necessarily. And I, I understand why. There's a lot of reasons behind why you wouldn't like it. But that was my first exposure. Because being a, a movie lover, when Gandhi came out, it was nominated for like nine Academy Awards. It won Best Picture. Ben Kingsley won Best Actor. And uh, there's a cameo by Daniel Day-Lewis in it. Is there really? There is. It's one of his first roles. He oh. plays a, a bully in an alley who bullies Gandhi and this Catholic priest who's a friend of, of Mahatma Gandhi. And it's just one little moment. He has like two lines in it. A really young Daniel Day-Lewis. Interesting. But... That's where I learned that there was such a that there was such a thing as a caste system, and that there were untouchables. I knew about the caste. I didn't. I didn't learn about that till um, till uh, the untouchables until the gun. That mm. was uh, I think the first time that I, I I learned about all the the terms. And then I, I, I think what really helped was Article Fifteen. Actually, helped a lot. <laughs> mm, yeah, uh, with with learning about that whole thing. But yeah. also in terms of other information, I, it's nice that movies have taught us. A lot of, uh, of oh yeah, like a, a lot of uh, you guys helped. I, mean. <laughs> I, I I had a thought, and this is just me putting one thing here and connecting it over here. Remember when we first saw uh, the Three Idiots, mm -hmm. and we learned about the pressure that's put on young people to become either an engineer mm -hmm. or you know, primarily being an engineer, but in Three Idiots. And I wonder, because I've gotten messages from a lot of stupid babies, as I'm sure you have, who have said, my family has an expectation of me to go in this direction, whether it's marrying somebody or following this career, but I want to do this. And I wonder, for those who come from Hindu families, which would be a huge proportion, is it a Dharma thing for mm -hmm. the families? Do they believe the child needs to go in that direction because that's their Dharma? That just occurred to me watching this. Is, does that create a worldview framework for some of those expectations on who you marry, where you live, and what you do? Mm -hmm. It would make sense if it does. I don't know. You can tell us. It just it, it occurred to me. And what I love about this video as well is I feel like it's accessible for both adults and kids. I feel like a little kid could learn from this and be engaged. Oh, yeah. And it keeps me engaged. Yeah, and, and uh, I think we saw that in a different video where it was an animation. I think it was maybe of some festival. It was an animation video. Which we need kid level uh, classes. We, yeah, we really do. We we really enjoy it. <laughs> and with and cartoon the, visuals, stuff we don't know. And cartoon visuals help. Yeah, what was the one with it was the a beautiful drawings? I think the it was pen, the pencil drawings. It was one of the festivals. Okay. Um, but was yeah. it Durga Puja? Might have been. It may have been one of our first introductions to Durga Puja. I think it was one of yeah. those. Anyway, yeah, yeah it, was, it was a really good video, really. Um, it was funny how often in life that you really, you hear certain things and you don't realize till you're older that they're from different parts. Like you hear a bunch of, like, <laughs> you've heard Karma Sutra your whole life. Oh yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Right? Well, but, yeah, but it, it, it does not, I, I thought it was, an, <laughs> once again, I thought it was just an Indian thing. I didn't know it was a Hindu thing. Right. Uh, I didn't, that, it never made that connection, which makes sense, obviously, because Hindus and in India right. kind of go almost hand in hand. Right. Um, but it just never it never occurred to me that this was anything other just than just an Indian thing. Right. And most people here, I think, would think that. I think most people in America would think when they, when you think the Karma Sutra, they would think Indian. They wouldn't think necessarily Hindu. I could be wrong in that regard. It also happens to be a moment I laughed out loud in Super Deluxe when the alien starts taking off the clothes. It's a girl, and he goes, oh, Karma Sutra. <laughs> that was a very Robin Williams moment. That made me laugh out loud. Yeah. And another thing too, I don't know, there are a lot, well, this is, <laughs> there's a lot of us Americans who are pretty darn stupid. And I know there's a lot of people who just don't even know the difference between Hinduism and Buddhism. Oh yeah. In America. Yeah. Just don't know. Um, it's not, it's not taught. No. Um, it's, uh, for those who are it's taught too, they just kind of zone it out and leave it be. And they would, just like, remember when we started to really understand the, the nature of the sick and how we said a lot of people here, if someone's wearing a turban, most Americans are going to instantly make the assumption that that person's Muslim. There's a lot of ignorant people in America, of course, but also just around the world. They just, and especially when it comes to religion. Yes. People are very ignorant in terms of religion. Religion is a... 
I'm not saying religion itself is dangerous, but religion can be dangerous in terms of how people use it. Correct. Obviously, throughout history, most of the wars have been about religion. Correct. <laughs> uh, so it's it, regardless of what the religion is, um, it's it's people are very passionate, so they don't want to learn about another religion because yes. they're like, no, right? No, that's because because every religion, especially the big global world religions, every single one of them have had bad things done in their name. And because of that, many people have said, no way, because you suck. Mm -hmm. Ra and granted, right. that's a justifiable stance. There's been crappy things done in the name of every world religion. Yeah, absolutely. And the sad thing is it causes so many people to just immediately put it in a prejudicial box as, rather than... As opposed to learning... And, and, and assume, Each, yeah, you, assume every Hindu's that way, every Muslim's that way, every Christian's that way, every Jew is that way. I, and that, I, I wish it would be more because in, in America, there's a lot of just uh, Christians that want the Bible taught. And I'm mm -hmm. like, why don't you want every religion taught so Dude. people can have a worldview so they can understand each We've other? We've got like, why? I don't get it. There was a spokesperson for a campaign of a senator who was on a talk news show who objected to the possibility that a Muslim could be in Congress because they said, when you get sworn in, you gotta put your hand on a Bible. One, well, that's not true. Well, that's what the newscaster was telling the spokesperson for a campaign of a senator. Yeah, a I, spokesperson I, I know for, you, you know what I'm talking about. I've seen it. And they didn't know that the person could put their hand on the Quran if they want to. Actually thought it was law in America that you have to swear on a Bible. That's not the law. And we do now have Muslim senators. It, it, it was, that, was a, that was a tough scenario for some of them, too, because there was also a law that she couldn't wear her hijab. I know. And thankfully, that was changed. It was quickly. changed. Yes. But there was, like, there's so many things, were obviously, off topic. But this was, uh, I, I enjoyed this video. I enjoy learning more about it one so we can better understand. I want to know more. I want to know. Yeah. Send us stuff on Islam. Send us yeah. stuff on Jane. Send us stuff on. Yeah. Uh, so we can understand more about you, but also understand, because it's obviously a lot of these that we've seen are referenced in almost oh. every Indian film we've seen. Yeah, I remember when we watched Badla, I wanted so badly to know what Big B's references were when he was constantly referring to these texts um, and saying these stories. And I don't know how many movies we've watched where... Almost all of them. Almost all like of them. And it was, a, it was really great when we started to watch some. And I could... Like, for example, I had learned about Durga Puja before we watched Kahani. So it was so cool to watch and pick up on. Ah, I know what that. I know what that means. Yeah. So yeah, yeah we enjoyed this. This was a great video too. Uh, shout outs to that guy. I'll, yeah. I'll link this video down in the uh, description below. Oh, and yes, by the way, what he said is absolutely true. Hit the like and the subscribe button. <laughs>